What does it take to be a successful entrepreneur? A dangerous amount of coffee and a ton of grit. My name is Jason Tracy, and every week I interview business leaders to share their stories, life lessons, failures, and advice with you. Welcome to Coffee and Grit. What is up? What is up? What is up? Welcome back to Coffee and Grit. And we have another difference maker in the studio today. I'm excited to have Brandon still with us. And for those that are loyal listeners, you've heard Brandon mentioned in our in our episode several times because he has been the hub of connecting me with several guests from his entrepreneur route unplugged retreat that he had at the beginning of June. Uh, phenomenal event. We're going to get in, talk about that and the other things he's doing with Integrated Life Company uh, here shortly. But uh, like I said, just uh, the, the the people in that orbit that have been on the show, Dr. Rhonda, uh, Corey from Red Oak Refillery. Um, we're going to have Corey Luber coming on. That's another thing. Guys, we're booked out until November on Coffee and Grit. Oh, that's awesome. This is, this Congrats, is fun. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's been super cool that... Um, People have just been kind of reaching out. I'd love to say I'm working hard, but we've been getting some really amazing guests lined up. And uh, like I said, I'm now kind of trying to be selective of protecting my dates. We're booking almost into Christmas, so it's uh, wow. it's pretty crazy. So super excited uh, with the, with the direction that that we're going, and there's going to be a lot of phenomenal guests. And we're going to start off here with Brandon because uh, I'm really super excited to dive into a conversation, meet more of Brandon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's been really cool seeing some of the people have been on, and you've got a great thing going here. So. I'm honored uh, to be here. My pleasure. It's one of those things like um, going to to your event. I wasn't. I didn't go that day thinking like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a bunch of gas for coffee and grip. But it was like, Dr. Rhonda comes out first person I met, and I'm like, just her energy, and we start talking. I'm like, I'm she needs to be on. I need to get her in the studio. And then yeah. I met Corey, and then the other. You know, it's like there's so many people there. There's just a collection. That was an incredible day. Yeah, it was uh, pretty phenomenal. You know. It's weird to think I was supposed to be like organizing or something. And I just wanted to hear from the attendees, from the speakers. I was like, can I just sit down and listen to everybody else? Because, you know, there's so much to learn. And everybody, speakers, attendees had such great stories to share. And well, that was, was really cool about that vibe, though, is because, and I've told people on the show, is like, I went as a speaker, but it was really cool because I got to be a part of the whole entire day. I got to go see the other speakers and be be an attendee, and then be a speaker. It's just the way the relationships grew from that yeah. was really cool. Yeah, you know, that, that was really the whole goal, is kind of get people a little out of their element and let them connect on a different level. You know, and uh, for those who maybe don't know, uh, the retreat was back in June, and it was at the Vialasi family farm, a honeybee farm. Um, we had great speakers, we had food, we had healing, um, and incredible attendees from all over the state. And it it ended up being a thing where like people were walking around barefoot, people were hugging, people were having these breakaway sessions, meeting with you know brand new people, and ended with a, a bonfire and music and. It was really cool to get to know people on a different level and form those relationships. People were very comfortable being vulnerable, especially as the day went on. I think it was because of that, you know, really comfortable vibe and the people in that, you know, the people are important. But I know in my breakout session in the afternoon, just about everybody shed tears as they were talking about their passions. And it was just really cool to see a group of entrepreneurs that were open to do that. Yeah. um, You know, that... It was really cool. People were very committed to embracing everything that was offered and, you know, learning, changing themselves. And so it was a lot of fun. We're going to do it again. So, uh, so be, be prepared for that to come out. So I know we have a mutual passion for small business. And it was like one of the things when, when I had a cancellation last week is like, I want to get Brandon on because I've seen everything you're putting out and where you're going. Yeah. And I want to talk about this. So wh- where does that come from? Uh, so I've, I've kind of always had a passion for small towns, small town value and small businesses are a huge part of that. Um, I moved to Clarkston in 2016, which I think is an awesome kind of traditional Midwest main street, small town. And the people that I've met, the people I've formed friendship with, uh, they're through business pretty much there there are other people who have storefronts down there and we started our first co-working space down there um and it's incredible to see the difference that a successful small business can make on a family on a community on a person's life and i really think it's something that we need to fight for to make sure as a society we're still embracing 
those small businesses as much as we are the large ones. I mean, they employ a ton of people too and have their place. Um, but there's a whole lifestyle around small business that I think is really important. I've always felt like the the small businesses were the underdog. So much attention is put on corporations and how they employ so many people. But I, if you chunk up the whole of small businesses, it's a much larger percentage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I forget the exact numbers, but like you said, if all the small businesses in America were one business, it would be far and away the largest uh, in the country. And it has such an impact on people's lives beyond employment and that sort of thing. You know, you always hear they're the ones who are sponsoring the baseball teams, Absolutely. the community parks, you know, the music nights on Main Street, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that that's what I hope we can continue to support and see it grow and make sure there's still a place for that in our future. Because we're talking about, I mean, Brighton, you're, you're in Clarkston, and I think we we both are, are spoiled with two of the better communities in the, in the whole entire state in a big big foundation of that is small business. It is the chamber. It is the, you know, it's, 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 that's what really brings these communities together. Yeah, absolutely. I had the pleasure of walking around Brighton today, even though there's some construction, I think I crossed the river four or five times (laughs) trying to figure out where to go. (laughs) Um, But it it looks like it's going to be amazing when it's done. And it, you know, kind of falls in line with what I'm trying to do. It looks like a people first design, you know, they're creating these parklets and improving pedestrian safety. And hopefully that means that people are going to spend more time down here, patronize more stores, stay for the day. And what's you know, the thing you have to go backwards to go forwards. And this is, I'm sure you've seen the news. <laughs> and I think when we <laughs> talked about it, you're like, Oh, I've seen that as far as the construction goes, because yeah. a couple of businesses, you know, went out of business and yeah, I'm going to say that, uh, and this may be controversial, but I've said it out loud. Uh, s- some of the businesses have closed up. I questioned how were they in business far before the construction happened, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's one of those things that if you're not opening your business on days at festivals or if you, if you sell ice cream and candy and mm-hmm. you're not opening up when there's a thousand people down here because there's a car show, you're probably going to go out of business. I think I'm glad I don't know who sells the ice <laughs> but, cream and candy, but, but so yeah, you're totally right. You know, there are yeah. things that you can do. So, yeah. um, so some, but sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards and mm-hmm. yeah, you know what, there's going to be some losses and casualties because there's some people that were struggling before that happened. And so then right. you shut down main street for the whole summer that hurts. And yeah. me, I live downtown. I love walking downtown. I see all the, but, but I know we got to go backwards to go forwards because what this is going to look like and what our businesses are going to be able to do to have open more retail space on the sidewalks to for free yeah. fire pit at the mill pond, you know, mm-hmm. like to be able to, to bring more community together. Right. It'll be worth it in the end. Yeah. You know, I, I think things like this construction project, you know, the pandemic, um, you're either embracing that it's happening and finding Absolutely. ways to work with it and around it, or, you know, it does kind of stink, but you're not, able to adapt um, you know and it was fascinating to me our businesses were able to stay open and um, you know looking up and down main street and seeing what our small businesses were doing to stay open and to support the people in the community uh, you know you have people who are afraid of going into places where there's a lot of people so we have a small store down the street that opened up their back alley and sold groceries in a drive through manner yes you know helped people get access to things they needed, helped them stay away from crowds if they weren't into crowds and help them help the business sustain through the pandemic. You know, I mean, that's totally embracing the challenge, thinking all the way around it. Um, Finding ways to solve problems. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great book I just finished. It's totally changed my way of thinking called um, The Obstacle is the Way. Obstacle is the Way. Okay. Uh, Really cool. It's based on the stoicism teachings of... um, Marcus Aurelius. Okay. I think. Um, but it, it's all about like taking the emotion out of the problem and analyzing the problem for what it is and not shying Sounds away from it, Yeah, but embrace it head on. And, you know, you start to see the weaknesses in your business model, but if you go towards it and find ways around it, you can come out on the other side stronger. And I'm sure these businesses down here are going to do the same thing. Well, and so for you, you have co-working spaces. Did you start those before the pandemic? I did. So we started our first space in 2018. Um, and then we started our second space. We were supposed to start it in early 2020. We pushed it a little bit. Um, 
during the summer, we opened our second space. Um, we were allowed to stay open. I forget what they called those businesses. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> Essential. Essential. Thank you. Essential. I, I was kind of hoping I'd never have to know again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Delete. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we were able to stay open, and it was a really interesting observation. Uh, we had established members, and particularly when they shut down the schools, uh, the people who were working in our spaces tended to have the more flexible jobs. And so I got a lot of, you know, the, the kids are home now. I have to be at home with the kids. And they left. Um, but then about a month later, we had this influx of new people who are like, my kids are at home. I cannot work <laughs> from home. I've never worked from home before. It's not working. So we got a lot of new people out of that. And it's kind of evened out. You know, some companies have gone hybrid and uh, some have gone all the way back. But uh, yeah, I think it opened people's eyes to a new way of working. Um, I think even for larger businesses that are employing these people, they're realizing, you know, there's a bunch of reasons that we could have people working from home or working from co-working spaces, you know, from productivity to the benefit to the employee and their cost on office space and that sort of thing. So I'm interested to see where that continues to go. Before we get back at it, a quick shout out for our sponsor, Playbook Builder, powered by AI. This show has always been about giving the resources and the tools to small business owners in order to grow and scale your businesses successfully. And so I'm so excited to partner with a company that does just that. If you've listened and heard any of our guests, you've heard talking about building process, developing and training, building culture, all such important pieces in order to building a great company. Well, Playbook Builder, powered by AI, has come along and revolutionized the game on how you can do that for your team and people. Whether you're onboarding new people, training and developing, continued training and developing, you're looking to scale your business or eventually sell, or most importantly, you're looking to build a legacy as a visionary. Playbook Builder, powered by AI, is able to solve those problems for you. For me, as a consultant, I've been able to plug in, and it's so amazing what I do for clients. I can now leave a legacy. And so, for example, I'm next week training a new hire for a company, and I've been able to build out the next month of her training program using Playbook Builder powered by AI. The cool thing about the AI, what does that do? What's the hardest part of building out a process? taking this step-by-step step and making it easy it easy to learn. What AI, the AI piece does is you can actually type in what process it is, whether you want to onboard, if you want to onboard a new employee, type in onboard a new employee in what type of industry you're in, and the AI will put together a, a foundation for you to build out your playbook. It is absolutely incredible. But don't take my word for it. Head on over to playbookbuilder.com and these guys have set it up to where you can take this for a test run with no obligations. Plug in what kind of playbook you want to build. If it's a sales training playbook, for example, plug that in in the description. And in the description, you can also put in what kind of industry you're in and then hit generate and it will generate a playbook for you. Impress from there and you can take a 30-day free trial of the playbook system altogether. Is your is your big driving force of that community? Yeah, you know, I I didn't necessarily go into it thinking it was going to be, um, but that that is definitely the main selling point. Um, pretty much anybody who is in our co working space, they could work from home. Mm -hmm. And when I started, I thought it was I'm going to go to a co working space to get away from people. <laughs> And it's totally not what it is. These are people who want to be around people, but they want to be around, you know, like-minded people, people who are passionate about what they're doing, uh, people who are collaborative, who want to see others in the space grow. Uh, even when there's overlap in industries, you see people collaborating. Maybe it's two photographers who decide to work together. Um, maybe it's website designers. You know, they're, they're people who are not competing with each other they're competing to succeed mm -hmm. um, and it's I think about finding a different way of life and in my optimistic way of thinking I think if more people embrace that and we can promote that more you're gonna have happier people a happier society and maybe things look a little better sometimes oh, when we walk around with that abundance mindset yeah I I was able to write a book last year, just uh, like a book that got published last August because of the collaborations I made with other sales consultants, sales coaches, people in the coaching consulting space, you know, but there's so many yeah. people that don't want like shut their minds off thinking that I don't want to 
work with talk to those people because they're in the same thing and then I'm, they're my competitors. Yeah, that was something that stuck with me the first time I saw you speak. Um, it was at our Pontiac co-working space. Adam Ranvo put on an event. And just the philosophy of asking questions, getting to know people, serving them through your sales, not just, you know, how big of a piece of the pie can I get for myself? That really stuck with me. And I think more people need to be exposed to that mindset and embrace it. And they really will be better off and they'll have more fun doing it too. It's one of those things like it really does make life easier. Yeah. We absolutely. work so hard to sell or to, you know, build relationships and it doesn't have to be that hard. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting in Brighton, you have uh, the two great co-working spaces. Yeah. Um, three. Three now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they've reached out to me. We've talked and it's like, are we competitors? No, absolutely not. And we've bounced ideas around. And I know at least for me, it's made me better off seeing their spaces and seeing what they're doing. And, um, you know, it. I think that is part of what makes Brighton such a great entrepreneurial hub as well as you have people with that mindset working together. Well, it's so cool too, because then we talk about these relationships. Like I had, I've known you for a couple of years now, met you through Adam and have been out to your spaces and, uh, in Pontiac and Clarkston a few times. Um, but then it circled back around when you were uh, looking for speakers for your event, you were talking to Clark Bradley who owns the space out here. Yep. And he was like, Hey, have you asked Jason? So it's like one yeah. of those things, mm -hmm. like it just kind of circles back around in the relationships that you, that you have. Yeah. Something really illuminating. Actually, Dr. Rhonda um, was just talking about this is how um, you don't necessarily give what you get in terms of, you know, I refer somebody to you, so you refer somebody <laughs> to me back. <laughs> yeah. um, but you get what you are. And yes. when you put out, when you're always willing to help people and you have that right mindset, you know, maybe it's not you who gives me the referral, but you talk to somebody who talks to somebody who then realizes they have a connection. Uh, and that's a, a great example right there. Of, you know, how it didn't really benefit him, but, you know, now... We're back in Brighton. We're talking about the community, hopefully bringing a spotlight to it. And, you know, indirectly it does. Maybe somebody sees this because they're interested in co-working and, you know, ends up over there. And yeah, so. It's over there. Yeah. And I love how in our, like I said, three, but our, our co-working spaces, they're all in that same abundant mindset. They all communicate to, to each other and they all know that all three of them are slightly different. Yeah. And I have great relationships with all three of them and mm -hmm. I've, I've, been able to use their spaces for different things. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. I've, I've been able to um, station my offices at, at Grit and Lavender. So, okay. Uh, and then I mean, it's the whole coffee and grit and grit and lavender. That's kind of yeah. how it was born out of that space. Okay. Um, but then I've done events at Brighton Lighthouse. I've done stuff at, at co the co working space. And so it's just cool to have three different spaces. And they're, yeah. and again, they're all a little bit different. I think that's what's cool is this kind of boutique co working. Um, you know, in Clarkston, we have an 1870s carpenter shop. Yeah. It's got original wood floors that we didn't finish or anything. Shiplap walls. Some people walk in there and they don't get past the front door. So <laughs> this is not for me. This is not where I want to work. And that's totally fine. Yeah. We're not going to try and, you know, put marble desks in there and, and dress it up for one person. We want the people who want that. Yeah. You know, and yeah. we've found them and. You know, I'm very happy to refer that other person to a place where they will be happier. You know, I'd rather have a solution for them and have them be somewhere where they're going to thrive. Well, because uh, you're bringing someone in your community. That's someone that's basically living yeah. there with you. And if they don't like it, and, and if you have to change what the space is to accommodate yeah. that one person, then you don't like it. Or yeah. somebody else in your space doesn't like it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's been interesting. And now kind of the, the next evolution has been the Integrated Life Company. Um we started it officially last November, um, but I was starting to get phone calls from other small communities saying, you know, we have a building, we have a chamber, we have a group that wants to recreate this ecosystem. And it seems like a co-working space would be a good place to do that. Can you help us? Um, and initially it was, yeah, let's go in. Let's see if there's a building we can buy. Let's see if we can start this up. Um, and what what changed was that instead of trying to own it and operate it myself as kind of an implant or a transplant to them, um, we've found cities with groups that want to operate it and they want to take ownership. They just don't know how. 
Um, so we're empowering them with the blueprint that's worked for us, which is a community-based, events-based, collaborative mindset. And we're helping with the layouts, the CRM, all of that sort of thing, and um, trying to help them create the same ecosystem in their town and creating the partnerships throughout you know, the community as well with the coffee shops and the libraries and the chambers. And it's really cool to see it unfold. Each one's a little bit that's different. so cool. Um, but... You know, there there's people out there who want this. They want to have that collaborative business community. Yeah. Uh, and they're just looking for ways to learn how to do it. So hopefully, we can help more and more people. That's so cool. So where are you? Where where are these spaces going in right now? Yeah. So I've been working a lot with Indiana. Um, the state of Indiana is really pushing entrepreneurship, uh, specifically in smaller towns. Uh, I've been working in Ohio and then also northern Michigan. And, um, you know, I, I think anywhere could have a co-working space. What it looks like, I don't know. But what I'm focusing on are the historic Main Street towns. Uh, they're cities typically with under 50,000 people. And, uh, you know, they want to have that neighborly community-based business group in town. Uh, so it, it's been really cool to explore. And That's freaking uh, cool. You know, I'd, I was thinking about a lot as as I was going to these places, like, what do I like about doing this? And it's really exploring new towns and places, yeah. um, seeing these historic buildings that, you know, some people want to tear down and it's like, wait, we can do something in here. You know, maybe it's not a restaurant. Maybe it's not something elaborate like that, but we can put this historic building to use. Um, and then getting to know the people, you know, there's, there's amazing people doing amazing things in every town. So it's been a lot of fun. So like, I love self-awareness and some of my favorite things are old buildings in downtowns yeah, and small businesses. So we're like speaking like love language here. So <laughs> I could die, talk about this all day. It's funny. I was in um, Kendallville. They have an incredible team there uh, bringing a co-working space to life. And we kept going and looking at buildings and every time we'd tour the building and then it would come to the basement you don't want to see the basement. I'm like, you have no idea <laughs> how much I want to see that basement. I don't care what I'm climbing down, how many cobwebs. I want to know what's in that basement. <laughs> so you have no idea how much I want to go in that basement. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> the reason I made the drive pretty much was to see that 1860s basement. Um, and I wouldn't say they're a let down. There's usually no hidden treasure or <laughs> bodies or anything, but there's been some cool stuff. And, uh, so it's fun exploring <laughs> the, the physical history of a town and really getting an appreciation for the idea that, you know, these towns were started by entrepreneurs. These are people who left everything they knew, you know, literally with their families in a wagon to start again in a new place to provide a better life for their family, you know, and, and thinking that those are the people who laid the bricks and the foundation of that building. And we can honor kind of that legacy, even though co-working seems like this new modern thing, you know, we're, we're on a, honoring the legacy of people from 150 years ago who had a vision for what that town would be and what the community would be. And I think the values are still there. I mean, I don't know why you chose Brighton, but I would think it's, you know, the neighborly feel, the community, yeah. the family friendly, yep. you know, that sort of thing. And that's exactly it. I grew up in a small town. Okay. I grew up in Owasso, which is between Flint and Lansing. And uh, it had a very Main Street, you know, I, I love my favorite thing as a kid was riding around downtown, you know, yeah. like going to the candy shop, going to the baseball card shop, like being able to um, go into the different shops and the people knew your name and they knew who you were. And it was just like became fascinated with that whole concept. And right. So being in Brighton you have the mill pond and you have the small businesses and you've great yeah. schools and great community and we're, you know, um, really entrepreneurial and, you know, so there's a lot of really cool things here that, that draw me here. Yeah. And, you know, talking about kind of going full circle and back to your roots, I think something that, you know, pandemics, social media, they've isolated people and people have realized how much they want to be a part of a community. So you're seeing, you know, candy shops opening up again and people are finding a way to make it work. Um, yeah. You're seeing baseball card shops and all these places yes. that people will go gather and talk to each other over a shared passion. And so the co-working space, I think, is an extension of that. It's people who have a shared passion of entrepreneurship, but all these other values as well. 
that is so fascinating to be in these different communities, like reviving the main street, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think it's really important that we, we fight for kind of small town Americana, um, and for the values that are present there. And, you know, I, I think it will kind of spread out across society. Um, and it's not to say that the urban centers that are your traditional hubs of entrepreneurship, um, that they don't have a place as well. Uh, you know, we're more focused on solopreneurs. We're focused on maybe somebody who was doing marketing for a company and decided, you know what, I can do this on my own yep. while making time for my family. It's not necessarily that we are, you know, looking for the next Facebook or the next Ford or something like that. We're, we're trying to provide an outlet for people who want to change their lifestyle to put what's important to them first. In how energetic and magnetic it is to be around those people all day. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, you know, we do uh, this thing called Social Circle. It's on Friday mornings in Clarkston. And it's totally free. It's open to anybody. It's co-hosted with our Chamber of Commerce, um, which is another huge partner, super collaborative-minded. Um, but it's amazing when you just open the doors and anybody can walk in, you know, how many people come in and are seeking that community and, we saw a lot of them at the retreat and it it's just really special to surround yourself with those kind of people. And I'm very lucky to be able to do that every day. How, how did you, what is your entrepreneurship story? How did you get into this? So, um, well, depending on how far back, <laughs> I yeah. guess you want to go. Um, I, I recently had a light bulb, bulb moment and realized that um, I grew up in a household with a single mother who started her own business in our basement and she raised two kids in a great community um, and still was able to come to all the things, the practices, the games, the vacations. We never felt like she wasn't able to be there. And so I think the passion goes all the way back to that. I never really thought about it before until I started having a family of my own. I was like, these are the important things I want to be able to do are these milestones. Um, you know, and then as uh, in high school and college, I worked for a small family business and saw what an impact it had on their family. And then I totally changed gears out of college. I started the day after I graduated in a sales role. Uh, I won't say for what company. <laughs> um, you would know them probably. Um, and I really hated it. Um, a great company. That, I mean, they did nothing wrong. It just wasn't for me. Um, you know, so... I did almost two years there, and it just got to the point where I dreaded waking up in Were the you morning. Were making a lot of sales calls, like hundreds a day, kind of you? Um, it was in person. I was, okay, I okay. was visiting locations. I was trying to narrow down the company. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say if you had too much of their product, you'd wake up with a headache in the morning. Um, so, again, great company. It just wasn't for me. It was for some people, and I realized I really missed that kind of small, family-owned uh, business where you feel like you're genuinely making an impact. And I was extremely fortunate. Um, I could go back to my own old job, but then I also had a friend who had just started his own consulting company. And I came in um, really with like a bookkeeping and accounting role. That was what I did in, in college. Um, and after a little while, he invited me to be a managing partner in charge of new business development. And that was incredible. I got to see the business plans of so many inventors and entrepreneurs and work with them and making them a reality. Um, and just an incredible experience really opened my eyes to how many people are doing such great things out there. Um, and then a move and a marriage kind of saw me reassess the travel aspects and that <laughs> sort of thing. So what's fun when you're younger, like becomes really inconvenient as your yeah. family. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Cause in my early twenties, I, I feel like I manifested this role where I could travel and go to the cool places yeah. and do the dinner meetings and stuff like that. And it, it was fun. Um, but then I needed to manifest something <laughs> else, uh, which I, I feel like I have now too. Um, so in, in 2017, I started my own consulting business and the co-working space really, it evolved from a true need that I had. Um, 
You know, the, the only time I've ever wanted to do laundry or dishes was when I was working from home <laughs> and should be doing a spreadsheet or something. And then I'm like, I'm going to take a 10 minute break and just scrub those dishes from Isn't it funny? You ago. never want to do them until you have to do something else you don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I really needed to get out of the house, be able to focus. Um, and I called around to existing co-working spaces and I said, we have a really cool town here. There's a couple buildings. And nobody wanted to do it. And uh, I I guess I was shocked. Maybe in hindsight, I shouldn't have <laughs> You were been, trying to be like a real estate agent trying to get yeah. somebody into the buildings. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought I was doing somebody a favor by saying, hey, Clarkston, and I'll be your first member. <laughs> um, but they kept saying, you know, uh, it's not a place for entrepreneurs. There's no need for this in your town. And uh, if you really want to get me to do something, say it can't be done or shouldn't be done. <laughs> I'll find a way for good or for bad. Um, so we, after some searching, uh, we got really lucky, got into the building we were in. And uh, to this day, almost half our people can walk or bike yeah. to the co-working space down there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you had this community of people who are all in their basements, in their spare bedrooms, you know, maybe they were at the local coffee shops, but if you've tried to do a sales call or something like <laughs> there, it's, it's not the place. Yeah. Um, there is a role for them. I love all of the coffee shops and all <laughs> the coffee. <laughs> um, so that was how we got started. And then, um, you know, Tim Shepard from Pontiac called me and he had a space in one of his buildings and he wanted to bring that to downtown. Um, and we've tried some other towns. We've been in Lake Orion. We did a different location in Pontiac, Plymouth. For various reasons, they haven't worked out. Um, but we have this blueprint, and I think we have it really well laid out for what worked for us and finding good fits for that model. Um, so that's the whole entrepreneurial journey up until now. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm excited to see where it goes. You know, this... Um, this kind of shift from owning and operating to helping others. Um, yeah, I would call it an expansion, not so much a transition. I want to help as many people as possible do this. And, um, you know, knowing my strengths and weaknesses, owning and operating just wasn't going to be the way. Um, yeah. But I love finding other passionate people and helping them and really kind of lifting them up so they can create their vision and they know they have some support. That is so cool because, again, you're seeing them kind of go out and, and have a purpose, passion, and, and run with it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. And I learned so much from everybody. You know, I go in and I'm supposedly an expert in this stuff. And, <laughs> you know, they say one sentence, you know, five minutes in, and they just blow my mind with, the, you know, all the thoughts that everybody has and the different perspectives. And, you know, I, I think it's very important in any business to be open to that. Uh, somebody once told me that business advice is like panning for gold. You know, <laughs> you want to allow as much in as possible, understanding that there's really only going to be a small nugget here or there. But if you don't let it in, you're never going to find that one nugget. And so I, I try to kind of live by that and, you know, listen to people. So then how do you discern and like sort through what's coming in? Um, well, some of it depends on the platform we were talking about, you know, LinkedIn and there's so many social media experts out there and it's like, you know, I, I don't necessarily need some, some person on Instagram telling me all the business advice. I want to meet with people in person. You, you can get a feeling for them, learn their story and, and see if it applies. You know, what, what might be great business advice to me could be awful advice to you just based on our different, you know, personalities or personal situations. So yeah. um trying to be very reflective and take things in and I do like to consider the source and have a good relationship. That's yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, it's uh um like essentially meeting people and shaking it out and yeah. understanding if it fits for you. Yeah. You know, I, I'm always happy to take a meeting and, and hear people out and try and gain something from it don't always have a second meeting but <laughs> that's okay <laughs> yeah so uh, tell me about the events and, and kind of that vision for what those are going to look like continuing yeah so events have always been really important to me um you know even before integrated life um we we started a music company and held music events as Again, a, a way to get people out of their traditional mindset and meet each other in a different circumstance. 
Um, you know, so we did music, we did the social circle, we've done lunch and learns, anything we can do to get a lot of people in the same room together. Um, and then the idea of the retreat kind of formed uh, as our community was growing. And we we're just talking about how we never, everybody's too busy. We never have a chance to like really sit down for a long period of time and explore various topics and kind of see where the conversations lead and you know, oh, I just met this person. It'd be awesome if I could spend 45 minutes talking to them without somewhere else to go. Yeah. Um, so the the whole unplugged theme was kind of about disconnecting from everything else, being present in the moment, and giving yourself the opportunity to learn, uh, to make deeper relationships, to explore, uh, you know, different collaborations, partnerships, ideas. Um, and the feedback so far has been that people really liked it. Um, so we're, we're going to try again next summer as well. And hopefully these are the first of many. I'd love it to be a, a big annual event and, uh, expand our geography with it too. Uh, we're looking at a place for next year that could accommodate some overnight guests and that sort of uh, thing. And, um, you know, maybe even turn it into really cool a weekend music kind of and thing. the campfire and the, that's the vision. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to it and, you know, this was our first one, so there was a lot of, um, you know, trial and error, seeing what worked and what didn't work, and everybody's been great about genuine, constructive feedback. Yep. Um, so there's there's an expanded vision for next year, and I'm really excited. That's so cool. Yeah. Would love to have you there. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm in for sure. Perfect. Maybe we could bring this whole room over there and do, like... I think that's doable. Grant, are you in? That is doable. Okay, yes, good. it is. Yeah, it is doable. They do travel. Didn't you guys go out? Did you guys go out to Dr. Rhonda's spot? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Not yet, but we have been talking about it. Okay. Perfect. I, I knew there was like a thing. I, I saw a video clip on Instagram and somebody, they were like doing some podcast episodes and they said something, somebody said something about Speakeasy Studios in the clip. So I was like, are they out there? I didn't know if they were out there. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see that particular clip. I got to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. It was just on Instagram like last week. And so I was like, oh, maybe they went out there and I haven't talked about yeah. it. But yeah. Hey, I mean, it, it's cool to bring things to an unexpected area, do something a little different every now and then. That's, yeah. You know what the retreat was all based upon. And then the education, um, you know, there's always something to learn. And, you know, I wish I could have relived the day a couple of times to sit through every presentation. And um, I was particularly disappointed to miss um, Robert's presentation on AI. AI was really good. <clears throat> He's a... Uh, I'll probably screw up the title. I think he's director of business intelligence for the Institute of Automation and AI, something. I couldn't remember where that he was from, but yeah. he's extremely intelligent. Yeah. And he's given presentations to um, our social circle and he's been very willing to meet with people in our co-working spaces about how to use AI. And, um, you know, it was really cool. We just had a discussion actually about, you know, people are afraid that AI is going to make things less personal. Yeah. And I was talking to this guy and he was talking about how he hates AI because he wants to have everything be genuine and in person. Um, and he runs a, a real estate group. And I said, OK, you know, how much time are you spending writing up like property descriptions and that sort of thing? Like if you could have that automated and take that two or three hours a week, you could go create more personal relationships like, you know, harness it in a way that helps you accomplish your goals. Yep. Um, but it, it really can be a powerful tool regardless of how you want to use it. From a copywriting standpoint, just an example of like the AI, you know, taking a video clip, like one of these clips, taking a one minute clip, mm -hmm. I, I can take that audio transcript, uh, put it into chat GPT and say, create a post, or create an engaging post for this, where the script and it creates a literal and then I can go in and change it and create, but it's, it's literal. Yeah. It's your words, right? Yep. So if I'm, if it's your clip, that's a minute long, it's using your words and it sounds like you. Right. Um, one of the, I think the best things I've done with it is, uh, if you do any paid Facebook ads, you know, it'll ask you five headlines, five descriptions, yeah. five, this, and by the time I'm done with two, my creativity is exhausted <laughs> and now I'm just, writing not great stuff yeah. over and over. Um, so I took my initial and I put it in and I said, generate five headlines. 
optimized for a co-working space in a small town for a Facebook ad and boom, 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 there it goes. Mm-hmm. Did it for all of them. Uh, the best performing ad I've ever had. <laughs> yes, so, exactly. <laughs> you know, and if, if that's what I need to do to get people into the community yeah. to help them, uh, I'm fine with that. And it <laughs> saved me a lot of time. <laughs> it's just very helpful. If you know, you know, it's, it's such a tool, but I learned so much from Robert and it was one of those things. There's a lot of scare stuff going on about AI and how it's yeah. going to take over the world. And I was, I had a much different perspective after listening to him and realizing it's just a, a language and an algorithm versus an all knowing being thing. Right. You know, I think, uh, you can, get more clicks on your Instagram posts if you talk about how it's taking over the world versus how, you know, like the Netflix recommending you things is AI just, and it's been around forever and nobody was scared of that. Uh, One thing he talked about too is like, he's like, think about it. And right now with everything coming out, these bigger companies and you hear it at the time, um, the um, CEO of ChatGPT was, and all these people were talking about scary scary we got to have regulations because if you think about it right now they're fighting because they realize it's about to be wild west and in, in 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 ai and they're trying to protect their own you right. know properties so it's not really necessarily the danger to us but the danger to them true yeah and i know there's artists out there who are worried about you know their songs or their books and that sort of thing and that's uh beyond me that's for somebody else to figure out i'm just gonna do facebook ads <laughs> all right well, so the first time somebody showed me chat gpt it was a friend of mine and she was like i'm writing a whole book and she started showing it to me i'm like that sounds like a computer wrote it and i'm, I'm very bored by the first paragraph you know yeah. there's there are there are pieces you've got to you can't write a whole book with it probably yeah i think uh for idea generation yes. you know that sort of thing um you know and something that we've talked about on the co-working space is the more that it's out there, the more genuine, authentic work is going to be appreciated and valued, you know, um, when everything is just kind of mediocre, whether it's Facebook ads or blog articles or whatever, when somebody truly excels and is an artist about what they do, I think that becomes worth a lot more. It does. Yeah. 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 Well, and so just even individual people of who's, who's working it, there's so many things, times where I've told somebody how I'm using it and they're like, Oh my God, I never thought about it that way. Or I've learned from somebody else or the way you're using it is probably yeah. different than, you know, so it's like the way we think is how mm-hmm. it's going to, how it's going to work. Yeah. Another great example. Um, so I mentioned the book, uh, the obstacle is the way, yeah. um, you may not just based on this podcast, want to go read this 200 page book, but I'm you can go, you can go in there and ask it for an overview or a summary of the book. You can ask it for key takeaways and I never, you know, yeah, I never thought of then that. maybe you're like, no, Brandon's an idiot. I'm never going to read this. Um, yeah. Or you are intrigued and you do set aside, you know, a significant amount of time to then go read the book. Um, but that's, that's something I've been doing too. Is Seeing exactly that. I never thought about give me a summary of this book and then yeah. now I can decide if I want to actually invest and read it or not. Yeah. We went down a whole rabbit hole of kind of doing that, asking for key takeaways and, um, then creating like, uh, social media prompts out of that. So, I mean, I read the book, so I asked it to summarize it and then I said, okay, you know, create five prompts for an entrepreneur based on the messages in this book and then had it optimized for LinkedIn, Facebook and shared those out there. Um, and it was really cool. It was nothing that I would have thought of, even though I read (laughs) the book. Yeah. Um, so just a, a great tool. And again, the, the purpose for me at least was to create a genuine conversation and it saved a lot of time and probably came up with a lot better stuff than I would have and accomplished that goal quicker of getting people talking and learning from one another. Well, and what's the difference when we talk about it being personal, but what's the difference if you were a big company and you had a copywriter writing it versus plugging it into right. chat GPT or whatever? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, like you said, if you said, write me a book, yeah, probably not. And it's not going to be very good. It's not going to be very good. It's gonna, it was very uh, bland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when you're using it to enhance creativity, you're using it with a positive goal. I, I think, you know, I think everybody should be looking for ways to do that. In any way we can make it easier. We have so many, we have access to so many tools and resources that make life easier. And even social media, you can use it to a detriment. And we've seen, you know, right. we've seen that. Um, but it's such an incredible tool too. And even just what we're doing right now and being able to create content and be able to put that out there and share it in clips to where people 
see it and are impacted by it. Yeah, social media, you know, it's very interesting. I really didn't get into it until I had my own business. Yeah. Um, even though the old company I worked for, they had a whole division for social media. Um, you know, and I advise people to go talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I never really got into it. And uh, when I started my own business, you know, it, it's a cost effective way to reach well, in the beginning, tens of people now, hopefully <laughs> dozens. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's cost effective. You can get your messaging out there. You can control your messaging. Um, and I would actually say Instagram has been like my number one source of co-working sales and membership. Wow. You know, I'd, I've sold offices straight through Instagram DMs without people ever stepping foot in the building before. That's so interesting. So you, you can create meaningful relationships there if you're doing it. The right way. Absolutely. You know, if, if you're just going to spam people in their inboxes, no. You know, but if, if you're asking questions, you're starting conversations, you can build a relationship that way too. Whether you're on social media or you're in person, there's a right way to build relationships. Right. And it's not spamming them or selling them. Nobody yeah. wants to be fooled. No. And nobody wants to sell them either. I'm exactly. Very, nobody. <laughs> very bad person to walk into a sales meeting with because I don't want to spend my money with anybody, <laughs> but, uh, no, it, there is a, a right way and a wrong way. And you know, the, the people who have a genuine approach, the people who come in and say, I want to offer this. I think it could help you. You know, I've researched what you're doing. I think you'll find this useful. I, I love having those meetings and, you know, creating partnerships there. So cool. Yeah. So I know you have a background in tennis, and I want to talk about that. Too. Yeah. And yeah. So um, that was actually, I mentioned, you know, through high school, I w worked for a family-owned business. It was a, a family that owned a tennis facility. Um, and one of my first jobs was getting on the court with the little kids, just tossing them tennis balls. And, um, you know, I kind of grew up in that role. I got to the point where I was a coach. I got to a point where I was traveling um, had some success with players traveling on the pro tour and, uh, started my own tennis facility, um, which was a huge education on so many things not related to tennis. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just figured, Hey, if, if I'm doing okay coaching, I should be able to run a Open facility. facility. And, wow. You know, yeah. The, the business side of it, as I'm sure with any industry like that, um, it was an education, um, but yeah, I, I love the sport. I'm not as good at it as I was, <laughs> um, but I love watching it. It's been very exciting uh, as new players have emerged on the tour. And uh, yeah, what's your passion about tennis? So I really don't, uh, but I just, I love, I love, I love sports in okay. general. Yeah. Uh, and I love kind of how that story unfolds and again, it's like it leads to that entrepreneurship and the lesson, right. the lessons that are learned. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, and I think it was cool too because it, it was a passion of mine and to be able to harness that passion and turn it into a business um it was one of those things that for a long time i didn't feel like i worked because <laughs> i loved what i was doing yeah. every day that i went in and you know a, a theme that runs through is it was a very people-based business i wasn't giving lessons over zoom calls you know, or coaching through video chats, you know, you're in person, you're talking to people, you're expressing yourself, dealing with their emotions, their psychology, and, you know, learning all of their goals. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I met a ton of great people through there. And uh, well, and that's, how do you take that transition from where you're coaching kids and you made it sound really easy in your steps and well, ah, coaching kids, and then all of a sudden I'm on the tour and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, in a lot of ways, I loved coaching kids more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite a ladder. You know, I, I started with the, the toddlers who, um, I don't know if it was tennis teaching or babysitting more, you know, <laughs> when they're like two or yeah. three years old. Um, and then kind of worked my way up. I became an assistant coach at the high school after I graduated, um, became an assistant coach at my college after I graduated, uh, and then was the head coach for the college. Um, and met a ton of great people and um, had an opportunity to travel um, on both the women's side and the men's side uh, throughout the country. Again, really cool to be able to travel and do all that sort of thing. But 
not a very family friendly lifestyle also you never know where you're going to be how long you're going to be there mm-hmm. um so that that dream of traveling the world for tennis also kind of it shifted i don't want to say I, I gave up on it or i'm sad about it my dream just changed i wanted to be home with family um so i i kind of let tennis go and focused on creating a business at home when it really comes down to like um the it's all community based like even even with tennis and that yeah. that that um that journey with all the people and the relationships that you built that yeah got you there yeah i you know i'm realizing it more as we're even talking about it now but i think people are always at the heart of what i've been trying to build um you know finding ways to empower people to do better at whatever it is they want to do whether it's on a tennis court or starting their own business or with the co-working spaces, even just controlling their lifestyle more. Um, it, it really is about people first. I couldn't sit behind a computer screen with spreadsheets all day. Uh, I want to see I want to see that impact. I want to work with people, help them accomplish their goals. There's certain industries that just like when people tell me what they do, I'm like, oh. <laughs> even yeah. on my worst day, I'm like smiling because I could be doing that. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I've... I've had, uh, particularly in my youth, I feel like I've had a very um, varied job history. And one of the things that I did in high school, I worked for a pallet recycling company uh, down in Detroit. And trucks would just drop off hundreds of pallets. And you just went through and we had this stack of new slats to put on them. Um, And it was a super mechanical factory style job. You just picked one up, took off the broken things, put the new ones on, threw it in another pile. Um, But the boss there was incredible. And the people who were working there were incredible. So it was fun. I really liked it. And I learned a ton about management and leadership when... You know, this guy could take this job that should have been so boring, so manual, um, and he made me want to come there and work. And when, you know, there was an order that needed to be done quicker or whatever, everybody wanted to do it for him. You know, we were not going to fail at anything that he needed done. So, again, just learning so much, and it was about the people in the relationship, not about the pallets. Well, and you, you look at that mundane job, and to your point, it's mundane and 99%, 99.9% of the factories that do that. It's, mm-hmm. it's a thoughtless job where people are just either going through the motions and doing it or they're miserable. Right. But it's that person that makes the difference. It's that leader that makes it like you talked about, like you'd go and get the job done because you had so much respect for that person. Yeah. It's the people that make such a difference. Absolutely. And, you know, that's what's so cool about what you're doing and hopefully about what I'm doing and the retreats and everything is we can bring those people together, give them the tools to do even more and go out and impact other people's lives. And then introduce them to each other. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's so <laughs> fun is when you bring those communities together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what I'm finding, and uh, I've said this several times, what I'm finding is like people, no matter where their geograph- geographic location, when you're connecting with the right people, you find these like connections that blow your mind. Like, yeah. you know, so people will connect you with somebody that they think you've never met from another area. And it's like, you're, you know, like I know that person, you know, it's just so right. weird how people are very intricately connected. Yeah. The six degrees of separation, yes. or, you know, even less, I think when you have like-minded people who are all working towards these similar goals of lifting each other up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like Dr. Rhonda, you know, like yeah. my, she was, uh, Michael Mann was, is, uh, was going to be on the podcast. He was the one that actually, he broke his nose last week. Oh, uh, you, you know, Michael, sorry, right? Michael. Yeah. <laughs> uh, broke his nose last week. So he wasn't able to come on. I mean, I'm happy to be here, but I wish it wasn't because somebody <laughs> broke their nose and experienced We rescheduled that. <laughs> it. He's good. I, hopefully he's good. Uh, man, that sucks. Uh, but so like, we were talking about uh, on Facebook and then Dr. Rhonda's like, oh my God, I'm meeting up with Michael a lot next week. Like what a small world and how we're, you know, how yeah. we're connected in this. It's just really cool how it happens. Absolutely. Yeah. So what's the coolest thing you've seen in a basement? Oh, well, there was one building. Um, it was close to Detroit. I think it's cool because of the unknown here, but there was a very big safe. It looked like... Um, I don't, like a bank style safe. It was a standalone thing. Um, 
And I mean, it looked like somebody purposely, like it was <laughs> relatively clean. It wasn't like knocked over or anything. Somebody kept this down there um, and we couldn't get it open. Big combination. I even tried like looking up the manufacturer's <laughs> name and we tried these like factory reset codes. It's still there, I'm sure. And so I really want to know there is still in there. what is in that safe. It, it's got to be something. In my mind, it's something <laughs> special. But that that will stick with me for a while. <laughs> I'm, I want to know what's in that safe. So yeah. you ever find out. <laughs> I will. I will share with everybody. Unless it's, you know, like a million dollars or something. I'll just keep that to myself. But, um, yeah, part partly the unknown. Partly somebody clearly had it there for a reason. Yeah. Like just getting it down into the basement would have been a lot of work. <laughs> and I don't think it was for, you know, like tax receipts or something. <laughs> you know? That's the coolest thing in the basement for me. And I wonder <laughs> if it's still in there. That's so cool. I'll have to drive and find out. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this, uh, I was a director of sales for these uh, Verizon, for Verizon franchise. And we had a location downtown Ann Arbor in this, you know, old building. You know, Taylor had been in there for 50 years and he, his retirement plan was to rent out the building. So mm -hmm. when he took over the space, they're like, Again, don't go in the basement. You probably don't want to go in the basement. It's like, no, I really want to go in that basement. <laughs> so I go in there and the the tailor's daughter was some weird artist and she had these like um like sadomasochist like um oh. uh uh, mannequins that had like spikes and whips and like all these it was yeah. really like okay i'm running up the stairs now <laughs> it was like it yeah. was really creepy it's kind of like what you want to find and then and then you don't want to find it <laughs> exactly yeah he's like yes mm -hmm. all right now i'm going back up <laughs> yeah yeah totally it's like what were you into <laughs> what was going on down here i felt like yeah. tom cruise and nicole kidman in that movie like <laughs> yeah like, eyes wide shut, eyes wide shut. yeah <laughs> like what was that movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a ton of fun and you know, I I always come back to you know when we're looking at buildings and exploring and that sort of thing like who are the people who built this? Who are the people who yeah. randomly held that thing up with that piece of wood? Like why? They had to have a reason and you know, trying to just think about what their stories were and kind of honoring that space and the hard work they put into it. Well, the space downtown Clarkston, it's, uh, you know, it's got that. I love those old buildings when you walk in, the wood floor creaks and, uh, you know. Um, yeah. And so it's like, what is the story behind that building? Yeah, 1870s carpenter shop. Um, there's a really cool picture. Um, the It had like barn doors on it and the... I'm assuming it was the guys who worked there were all around a table playing cards. And that's always stuck with me because I was like, okay, like they were creating their own relationships and community even back then. Yeah. You know, and it had nothing, nothing to do with the carpentry. You know, they're sitting around playing cards, chatting, I'm uh, assuming about life in general. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that spirit lingers on in there, in the the relationships that are now formed and the conversations that happen, and, you know, it, it's a very cool building. That's so awesome. It's yeah. like paying the homage, bringing the, the history back. And it's like, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I've been so passionate about the main streets and not because there was a period of time where main street started to die. Right. You know, and it mm -hmm. was going to the malls and the, you know, the, um, more the concrete areas. Right. Yeah. And to see kind of that boom. And I think, probably pandemic to your point had a lot to do with it and people going back to their hard their their values but also there were more entrepreneurs and solopreneurs that have popped up since the pandemic and yeah. people going back to that being realizing i don't want to do that miserable thing anymore i want to go and have that passion that purpose and, and, and start a business right you know I, I know some people view it differently but i think people embracing like independent contractors and freelancers in general yeah um you know even from the company point of view you're not playing paying all the employee taxes and all of that sort of thing and you're not stuck with one person who may or may not be doing the job the way you want them to and then on the other side you know, if I am that freelancer, that independent contractor, I can control my time more. I can control where I'm working, who I'm working with. Um, you know, so you, you give up some things, but you embrace, you know, others. And I think a lot of people have, have found some value in that. Well, it's huge. And, and you know, 
encouraging entrepreneurs is, is find that find those things that make you happy and light you up for I, I think both of us really relate in those small towns and uh and, and we have a lot of that same that history and stuff like that and kind of honoring that history and uh you know what lights you up because we do get that choice as entrepreneurs and we can we can create that reality you, to your point you can manifest it yeah yeah i've um i've summarized it as the four freedoms and it's um freedom of time you know, if I'm not a morning person on a given day, I don't have to wake up and work at 7 a.m. on that day. Yeah. Um, there's freedom of association. You can work with who you want to work with. Um, there's freedom of location, you know, so you don't have to be in uh, downtown Detroit, Chicago, New York. You can go where you want to go. And then lastly, and equally as important, or maybe even more sometimes, is freedom of finance. Um, I really think if you're building your business the right way, you're going to find more financial success because you're embracing all those other things as well. So cool. And Brandon, thank you for coming out here and, and, and sharing your story and sharing that. That was a, a, just a, like, that's a great bike drop right there. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate what you're doing and look forward to seeing more of it. Oh, I, I'm looking forward to continuing our relationship and in, uh, in, in more, uh, more events. And I'm looking forward to the next Entrepreneur Unplugged. Perfect. Try and get out of it. You won't be able to. <laughs> <laughs> I will not yeah. try to get out of it. All right. Thank you. And thanks, Grant, for all your work, too. Hey, you got it, man. <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.